the only Gregory Abbott that I recognize is the guy who sang Shake You Down. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Come on, girl, let's start the show. Right? <laughs> but the show is underway. Dave Zyron, how did you spend your bring it in off season? Well, I had so much spare time since I wasn't chopping it up with you. So I got some folks in the neighborhood and we started an Eddie Grant cover band. Uh, which <laughs> so we get them, we get the instruments in the garage, play some Electric Avenue, some police off my back. And I become uh, Guyana's greatest singer for a few short moments. You beat me to the Electric Avenue joke because I was going to ask you if that was where you lived. <laughs> but I guess you spend the remainder of your time romancing the stone. Ooh, but, <laughs> nice. Never leaving a poor heart alone. Great song. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, as far as my off season is concerned, I, like you, uh, spent it dabbling in some music. I managed to get my hands on a digital keyboard um, and I might start teaching lessons and you guys are like, well, you, you actually know how to play. And I'm like Mar Marge Simpson. All I got to do is stay one lesson ahead of the kids. But yes, yeah, so I've uh, learned to play a few chords. Uh, like I said, in about, if listen, if 12 months from now I have graduated to ham-fisted hack status, I'll be doing very well with my, uh, with my, with my piano lessons. Um, but what I did with my off-season, what you did with your off-season, uh, doesn't equal what Megan McPeak did with her off-season. Uh, Meg, we heard that you made history. Tell us about it. Yeah, I mean, a little bit. <laughs> um, no, so I had the opportunity uh, to join four other amazing women um, and TSN and MLSC with the Toronto Raptors and, and make history as the first uh, all-female broadcast uh, back in March when we did the uh, Raptors Nuggets game for TSN. So a really cool moment. Um, for myself and the other women and a cool moment for the Raptors and a really awesome, you know, step in my career that, uh, you know, kind of ties in with being the first uh, to do so. So a really great moment. And, you know, Kate, Amy, Kayla, Kia, they all absolutely uh, killed their roles in the broadcast. And it was fantastic and really humbling to work alongside all of them. Mm. Let, me, let me just clarify, no broadcasts were actually injured or harmed uh, the night <laughs> Megan <laughs> made history. She meant that in the totally colloquial sense. But hey, guys, it's it's great to be back with you um, in person instead of trading texts about uh, the, the normal nonsense we usually trade texts about. And welcome back um, to the audience for season two, episode one of Bring It In, where I meet every week with Megan McPeak and Dave Zyron. They're both in DC. I'm here in Toronto on a retreat because I'm writing a book. <laughs> That's going well. Um, but week to week, day to day, we're with you guys uh, talking about the places where sports and culture and uh, politics and business um, converge. We talk about this all the time. It's less an intersection than a, a demolition derby, but I have the best panel in the business to help make sense of it. So this week we're talking Olympics. We are talking volleyball. So here we are. It is, we record on Monday mornings. We are approaching uh, 100 days out from the beginning of the Tokyo Olympics. And if there's one thing journalists love, it is big round numbers. We are pretty bad with other numbers, like innumeracy is a, is a big problem in our industry, but a hundred days out, we can tackle that. And two more numbers, Dave Zyron, we got to reckon with. Um, recent opinion poll in Japan says 72% of Japanese residents are against going ahead with the, the Olympic games this summer. Um, and, a statistic that might or might not be related, but apparently as of this weekend, only 1% of Japan's population had been vaccinated against COVID-19, which is an even slower rollout than we're experiencing here in Canada, which I did not know was possible, but it's possible. So Dave Zyron, 100 days out from, from the 2020 Olympic Games, which will take place in 2021, um, how sure are we that these things are even gonna happen? Well, I think the Olympics are at this point too big to fail. They did not want to cancel the Olympics last year in 2020. You know, that was done kicking and screaming and only because of the protests of athletes, actually, who were finding themselves unable to train. And then they were actually worried about if they went to Tokyo, like less so about COVID and more so about their inability to achieve any sort of optimal performance or getting hurt. 
uh, in the process of doing the Olympics. That's the only reason the 2020 Olympics are in 2021 in the first place, as bizarre and Orwellian as that is. But, you know, this makes me uh, sad in so many respects because, you know, I've, I've been to Japan, I've been to Tokyo. It's got an amazing sports culture. I wish I was there right now, now that Hideki Matsuyama has won the Masters, uh, the first person from Japan to ever do so. I mean, what a historic thing. And golf is huge in Japan and particularly Tokyo. So this should be like a, a, a celebratory day, you know, like, oh my goodness, we won the Masters and now we're a hundred days out from the Olympics. But unfortunately we're dealing with a global pandemic that's been mishandled certainly by the IOC and their approach. They've been clumsy every step of the way. And then though the ruling leaders in Tokyo have been completely unresponsive to uh, the concerns of the people in Tokyo about the Olympics. You meant, I'm surprised that number honestly isn't higher. Uh, there was a time where it was very upwards of 80% of people who didn't even and want it there so we'll see if that changes as the day gets closer but i think this is going to happen even if they have to have athletes in a hermetically sealed tent and you have them compete against each other that's where we are right now the olympics too big to fail tokyo is going to bear the brunt of that the people of tokyo are going to bear the brunt of that but there will be uh games on our televisions this summer right and how hermetically can you seal this tent right mm -hmm. here in toronto we just had uh, a few of the Toronto Raptors over our spring break sideline with COVID-19 over to Vancouver, what, three quarters, almost 80, 80% 80 of, of the Vancouver Canucks delegation laid up with COVID. And then the NBA, the NHL has said, Hey, this Friday, the 16th, y'all go back into action. Like, have you guys been paying attention? These guys are laid out with this virus. It's not like getting a cold. So Megan McPeak, like how, how tightly can they really realistically expect to seal this bubble and have this games, this, these games go off without some serious health consequences? I mean, when you think of it, the best they can do at this point is not allow fans, period. Full stop. If you want to try and keep it as safe as possible for the athletes to not get the virus, then you need to not have fans. And that is a huge revenue for every city and, and country that hosts the Olympics, whether it's the summer or the winter, is the travel and tourists that come mm -hmm. into the countries and cities to watch their respective athletes. And, you know, a, a respect goes to the Japanese citizens. If they're afraid of having this games and they don't want them, the one thing you can do to at least show respect for them is not have fans, including people in Japan that live there and are citizens there and are staying there and are not traveling back and forth. That's probably, in my opinion, the best way that you can protect these athletes and the citizens of Japan is not having fans, period. And essentially, outside of the athletes and their delegations and the people who have to be in uh, mm -hmm. Japan for the Olympics and whether it's broadcast, media, all of that, as long as they are cleared to be there, those are the only people that should be traveling into the country as well. So they essentially need to turn the entire country of Japan into its own bubble and do everything they can if they want these games to happen because the biggest thing is health and safety. We've seen in different sports, as you mentioned, that the bubble can burst if you're having people traveling throughout trying mm -hmm. to be as normal as possible. So in my opinion, the best way to protect the athletes, protect all those that are going to be working at the games is to lock down the entire country and really and truly not allow anyone into that country that is not supposed to be there for the Olympic Games or is not a citizen of Japan and has a reason and a right to be there. If you're a tourist and you're traveling in, sorry, we're closed. And yes. Maurice, can I jump in? Yeah, go go ahead, ahead, David. It is having been to Tokyo a couple of times, most recently in late 2019, I got to tell you, it's, it's the cleanest city I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, and there's not even that many garbage pails around. I mean, people literally walk around with little bags of trash looking for trash receptacles. It is a <laughs> clean city. People wear masks um, for flu purposes, even before COVID. And so the th I, I, I feel it in my heart, like this idea of all these people coming into Tokyo. I mean, imagine your relative who keeps the cleanest possible house. And then all of a sudden it's Thanksgiving and everybody's tromping in with their shoes, not taking them off the floor, <laughs> coughing over all the silverware and whatnot. I mean, so, and, and then you, the host is Tokyo, just basically standing there in the corner, all clenched up because it's like this, they've done an amazing job in Tokyo. Like you mentioned the low vaccine numbers. They also have very low COVID numbers relative uh, to the size and concentration and numbers of people. And that has everything to do with the collective will of the Japanese people to not catch COVID. 
to wash hands, to wear masks, to do all this stuff. So they have done all this amazing work since the pandemic started to minimize the impact. And now they're getting the Olympics. Like it feels, it feels unfair, frankly, given the amount of sweat equity they've put into staying safe. Yeah, absolutely. And to, to Megan's point about, about ticket sales, um, the IOC has already said, and Japan has already said, the organizing committee has already said, hey, overseas spectators, y'all can't come. Um, but what I don't understand, well, I, I do understand it, like this reluctance to cut losses, like there's no amount of normalizing that will put us back into normal times, right? The only thing that'll put us back into normal times is widespread vaccine uptake and the best way, which is the safest way to achieve herd immunity, which will which will mitigate the risk and eliminate the risk of going outside and getting sick. So like these sports promoters, like worldwide, whether it's Major League Baseball or the, the Texas Rangers saying, hey, everybody come back to our park. Like guys, I understand you need money. We all need the money. And all of us, most of us, unless you're Jeffrey Bezos, would be making more money. Like regular people, we would all be making more money if not for a pandemic. But but guess what? The pandemic's still on and you cannot prioritize whatever marginal uh, monetary gains you think you're making over people's health. But this is what we're doing. I don't understand it, um, but I do. Dave, you're gonna say something. Oh, just at the rate, you mentioned the Rangers and that, that was just one of the more, um, bizarre moments since this pandemic started because you have major league baseball moving the all-star game out of georgia to denver you have the governor of texas saying we should boycott baseball and then you have <laughs> he fans. also said they have herd immunity but they the science doesn't back it either <laughs> yeah exactly and then what the, fans, hold on hold on hold on what what does what does what does greg abbott know about herd immunity exactly N not a lot not a lot, um, and, and but th to me was one of the what, what made it so so ridiculous and, and, and almost literary that you had then the stadium filled and people were sort of like, yay, because on the <laughs> one hand it was like standing up to the governor who was like I'm not for moving the All Star game, but on the other hand it was an egregious breach in any sort of safety measures that should exist in the state of Texas. It was just a very bizarre moment for me as somebody who watches this stuff like okay Dave Dave let's call it what it was what it was it was asinine it was asinine uh emphasis on the yeah. first syllable <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so guys an audience so if you're keeping score uh Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, said no restrictions. Hey, Texas Rangers, if you feel like filling your ballpark on for your home opener, do it. He did that to stick it to the folks who think we should take the pandemic seriously. In the interim, in between that announcement and uh, the home opener, everything happened in Georgia. And MLB said, well, we're not going to keep our, our signature event in a state where lawmakers don't think uh, everyone should be able to vote. So they moved. So Greg Abbott, who was scheduled to throw out the ceremonial first pitch, he canceled the event that he essentially convened. Sorry, he canceled his appearance at the event that he essentially convened and said, I'm not gonna throw out the first pitch because he, I wanna, I wanna stick it to the left-wing woke mob that oh, chased oh. MLB out of Georgia. <laughs> Right. So if you're keeping score, the big gathering was to stick it to the left wing woke mob, but also skipping the big gathering was also to stick it to the left wing woke mob. And all of this adds up to tell you why the only Gregory Abbott that I recognize is the guy who's saying, shake you down. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Come on, girl, let's start the show. Right? <laughs> but the show is underway. Um, and the other thing that happened over the break was that we got to see firsthand or secondhand because firsthand people were on the scene sending us pictures of the disparity between uh, NCAA men's big time revenue sports and NCAA women's big time revenue sports, right? You had the, the men's basketball bubble in Indianapolis where the weight room looked like what you would see on campus. And you had the women's uh, basketball bubble in San Antonio where the sum total of the weight room was a little tree, right? With the dumbbells going up to, I think, 30 pounds. And it looked like one massage Cairo table. And that was that. And somehow the people organizing this event thought that this was adequate. And you would think, uh, given the bad press the NCAA generated uh, behind 
that snafu that they would have learned their lesson when NCAA women's volleyball tournament started or was scheduled to start uh, this week. Uh, and you would have thought wrong because in the week leading up to the tournament, uh, teams arrived on scene in Omaha and noticed that they were expected to play in a convention center with a bunch of courts laid out on the floor, but with no place to change clothes and no real schedule in terms of how to warm up before the game. Um, and uh, with a bunch of these first round games, uh, no broadcast crew. So if you were lucky enough to catch a stream, the stream wouldn't have commentary. Uh, and so this is how uh, the NCAA had decided to run the event and also present the event uh, of um, the showcase event of like, what is actually a pretty big time uh, women's college sport. Megan McPeak, how surprised are you that the NCAA did not learn a lesson after the fiasco we saw in March? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anybody anybody who put money on the NCAA changing in a week lost a lot of money. And it was the dumbest bet you could ever make. Like, I was, first of all, I was not shocked at the NCAA women's tournament and what they had. That's just the NCAA doing what they do best, not caring about anything but the men's side of sports, not caring about their athletes, period. Uh, they didn't apologize because they felt bad. They didn't apologize because they were wrong. They didn't apologize because they had a misstep. They apologized because they got caught publicly. Mm. There is a generation of athletes, both male and female, that are not standing for what the treatment has been for the past how many decades. They took advantage of the voice and the power that they have, and they put everything that the NCAA thinks they stand for on blast. And the NCAA has egg on their face. And really and truly, Mark Emmert needs to walk away because he's not the person that should be leading the NCAA. You do not put the blame on the women athletes and the women's side of sports to figure out the issues that need to be fixed. They've been telling you the issues from the beginning. They've been telling you the issues for decades. You need to listen and put people in power that can actually make the change that is necessary. I know for a fact these female athletes can lift more than 30 pounds at their first set, <laughs> not their max set. So the fact that you then do that and then turn around and disrespect the volleyball players by not even broadcasting or setting up a broadcasting partner for the first round of the national women's tournament, you don't set up locker rooms. I've played in convention centers. For AAU, I've, I've, I've broadcasted games from convention centers. The NBA G League does their showcase in Las Vegas in a casino mm -hmm. set up in a convention center, the same place where they host a huge car show. They have locker rooms. Why can't the women's volleyball program have locker rooms? Why would you not think women need to change somewhere? So what, they have to change in their hotel room and then walk and take the elevator in their um, uniforms down to where they're supposed to play? Where are they supposed to warm up? You want them to just go cold on the floor? That's what you're setting. You're setting them up for major injuries. The NCAA needs to tell Mark Emmert, you're no longer needed and your services are done as of now because they continue to make misstep after misstep and now they're getting caught. They don't care that they're, that they're doing something wrong. They're more caring about the fact that they're getting caught publicly. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah, Dave, I'm going to throw it to you in a second because one of the excuses that, might wind up being offered for this disparity uh, is, you know, is a question of budget. The men's basketball tournament generates this number of millions of billions of dollars every year. The women, all these other uh, championships don't generate as much money. But um, when the rest of us say, well, why don't you pay players? The NCAA says, hey, 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 we can't treat this like professional sport. It's not a business. We can't pay players because the, the revenue the men generate playing basketball and football has to pay for all these non-revenue sports. But then when the non-revenue sports uh, would like first class treatment, then the NCAA says, well, why should we give them first class treatment? Because they don't generate any money. So the money is there. It's a question of priorities. Dave, go ahead. Just, you know, sexism is a hell of a drug. And one of the things that it's doing to Mark Emmert right now is it's actually creating an Achilles heel um, because he has been, I would argue, repugnant in his position of leadership for years. 
But what we're seeing right now, and this could be his Achilles heel, is that he is hurting the NCAA's ability to make money. Mm -hmm. Because women's basketball is on the precipice of being big business, but it can't be big business if its wings are clipped. And that's exactly what Mark Emmert is doing. If you look at issues, and this is amazing statistically, um, if you look at issues like social media impressions, Instagram impressions, NCAA women are so far ahead of men on the basketball front. Absolutely. It is a profit center, and there are reasons for that. You know, one of the reasons is women more likely to play three, four years. People get attached to the players. They like watching the drama of the four year arc of their play and that causes brand loyalty you know because people are attached to how these players are doing over time there is money to be made there hand over fist but mark emmert is blinded from being able to do that that's why he has this ridiculous uh, prehistoric setup where the head of women's basketball at the ncaa has to report not to mark emmert but to the head of men's basketball <laughs> like that's the flow chart even like there's not even a direct connection and so he can i guess claim it ignorance but it's also the setup that he has set up himself like i said sexism is a hell of a drug and i would apply that as well to volleyball volleyball is a big business in this country volleyball is huge volleyball is the second most popular sport in brazil which is only one of the biggest countries on earth there is Mm. money to be made from women's volleyball but they can't see it for the very reason that they can't see that the weight room is absolutely disgusting and insulting compared to the men's so i'm actually thinking that this is what's going to eventually lead to mark emmert having to step down in that he is cutting the, the sports themselves and their ability to achieve revenue off at the knees yeah absolutely and the 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 double standard is galling like for so many reasons like i have a niece she's in 11th grade she's a very good volleyball player and um she is uh look when i was her age like i dreamed of being really good at sports and like in my wildest most outlandish late night dream i did not dream of having the talent that my niece has right because she's tall and i'm not she is like naturally strong she's a a very good volleyball player and has been on the sidelines because of the pandemic but one of the uphill struggles that every sports parent um sports uncle sports mentor coach that works with uh teenage girls like the attrition rate is off the charts when girls get to grade 10 11 and it's it's a question of um trying to 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 make talented young women understand that there are opportunities and that they can that if they take this sport seriously it can open doors for them like when i was coaching guys it was the other way around i'd have to tell these guys listen you don't have the talent to do the things you're trying to tell me you can do but like with a lot of the girls listen you have the talent you just need to take this seriously and you can open doors for yourself so now when i have these talks with my niece um you know, I tell her that you can open doors, you can access opportunities if you take the sport seriously and, and sharpen the gifts that you've been given. And here's the NCAA saying, yeah, young women, uh, take the sport seriously, but not too seriously because we don't take it that seriously. And how do you know we don't take it that seriously? Because y'all are changing clothes on the sideline and at, at a convention center instead of having um a proper locker room. Y'all are over here lifting 15, 20 pound dumbbells instead of having the same weight room setup that you would have uh, on campus. And so it's an already, it's, the, the fight is uphill already and the NCAA in doing things like this makes it much more difficult for the rest of us. Um, so social media but, is also such a, an incredible- Go ahead. I was mentioning Achilles heel with Mark Emmerich, you know, injustice thrives in shadows and it's very yes. difficult to have shadows when you have uh, people just being like, look at my weight room, check this out. Or when you have players mm-hmm. without hashtags, like not NCAA property. <laughs> and, you know, these things have allowed these athletes, I mean, athletes, particularly women athletes have had these complaints for as long as there have been women's sports you know, and promises of the equity that were brought by Title IX. But I think the ability to bring those pictures to the public themselves is another, it's the last thing that Mark Emmert wants and actually favors the side of people who want to fight for more equity in sports. Absolutely. And not to mention the fact too that in a more equitable world, like this burden would not fall to the players. The players are already like overscheduled, 
overworked. Playing your sport is a full-time job. Keeping up with your classes is a full-time job. Doing all this during the during a pandemic is even more difficult. And yet the players also have to become stewards of their own well-being and their own opportunities because whoever's in charge of stewardship is looking at the bottom line and trying to figure out ways not to share money rather than figuring out ways to share the business and uh, create a bigger pile of money for everyone, which is insane. The simplest but, thing um, too, guys, is if you want to use the argument as Mark Emmerich consistently does, and so does the NCAA, that you know women's sports don't generate revenue, can't generate revenue if you don't invest in it, full stop. If you invest in women's sports, it's been proven that when you invest in it, there is a return on investment, but you have to actually make that investment first. And until and unless the NCAA does so, they're going to continue to use that excuse. But eventually, it's going to not no longer be an excuse because the numbers, as Dave mentioned, social media alone proved that the interest is there. It proved that the viewership is there. The viewer numbers for the NCAA Women's Tournament were through the roof. They set the bar on competition this season, and the men did not meet it. You look at the final four in the national championship games, the women were much more entertaining. I'm sorry, guys. That's just how it is. You can't, in my opinion, as an as an athlete, I don't want to watch a 20-point blowout in a national championship game. I want it to come down to the final possession. And we got that <laughs> in all of the games from the women's side. <laughs> Right. And listen, we're going to get deeper into that discussion as the NBA draft approaches, because there's also the fact that the women's women's NCAA players are basically, uh, you know, the second best group of players, the second best, the highest concentration of the second best group of players in the world uh, until they get to the WNBA, whereas NCAA, there are a lot more ways to get to the NBA now, and those just 1% sub NBA players who you used to be in college 30, 40 years ago, they're playing a lot of different places now, only a few of them in the, in the NCAA. So you're not going to, you, if you understand that like this lower quality basketball that you're seeing on the men's side is about to become the norm and not the exception. Um, but I'm all the way in on players finding their own way to the NC, to the, to the NBA. Um, we're going to find out right now what, our all-star panel are in and out on Canadian adjacent Dwayne Johnson, also known as The Rock, uh, and his ex-wife, Danny Garcia, who's also his business partner. They have been speaking really publicly about making a deal with the CFL. Um, they want to come save the struggling league. Uh, Megan McPeak, are you in or out on Canadian adjacent Dwayne Johnson cutting a big check, C-H-E-Q-U-E, to save the CFL? I mean, who else is going to save the CFL? It's not like this is a one aspect I think that he could actually do something positive for the CFL. He knows the league because he played in it. He knows the game of football so he can try and figure out how to market this league in a better way because that's really one of the biggest crutches that the CFL has had is just marketing and, and getting in touch with you know youth football and whatnot. So I think this is a positive move for the CFL because if not The Rock and, and Miss Garcia, who like who else is going to do it you're looking at you're looking at teams and cities that are that are risking losing their teams and losing the league so it's been a hundred years that you know this league has been in existence so if not them then who's it going to be yeah dave Zirin. absolutely i don't see any other rudy poo candy ass stepping up <laughs> to to the CFL. and anybody who's read the rocks uh, autobiography which i have which i did <laughs> yes. knows that, you know he, he's got so much love for the cfl that that's where he could have gone straight into wwe as a two-generation legacy but instead he went to the cfl he's got stories in his book about his team having nowhere to sleep so they go into the dumpster and they pull out <laughs> mattress, mattresses and putting them out on the floor just because they had so much love for the game and for the league i mean so he's got that deep into the marrow of his, vein, of his veins. So I love the idea of Dwayne The Rock Johnson being the savior of the CFL. It makes sense. It's cinematic. It's perfect. And he's got the love. So why shouldn't he do it? Absolutely. I'm all in on two things. On this. <laughs> I'm all in on two things. One is uh, pulling up Dwayne Johnson's Instagram and seeing him add uh, the CFL to the long list of products that he is constantly hawking on Instagram. Oh, I'm just gonna take my Zoa energy drink before I put on my um, The Rock Project Under Armour uh, sweatshirt 
and uh, head to the Iron Paradise. And after that, I'm going to watch uh, Toronto. I'm going to watch the Labor Day Classic between Toronto and Hamilton and see who gets the most rouges. I, I look forward to that. And I also look forward to the CFL showing Dwayne Johnson and Redbird Capital and the XFL how to run a football league that lasts. As our friend uh, Arash Madani over at Sportsnet pointed out in an, in an interview with Three Down Nation, there really has only been one football league in the NFL era uh, to endure. It wasn't the NFL, and that's the CFL. The XFL has come and gone twice. Alliance of American Football, World League of American Football, USFL, they've all come and gone, and the CFL has stayed. So the CFL, financial problems aside, has some staying power that other football leagues don't have, and I'm interested to see uh, how that happens and how close we are going to get to a world champion of three down football if they wind up taking this thing international. Last one, we're going to hit this quick. Joe Musgrove of the San Diego Padres. He threw a no hitter the other week uh, and said he worked fast because he drank 12 bottles of water before the game. And from the fifth inning on, he really had to go to the bathroom. Uh, Dave Zyron, are you in or out on extreme hydration as a way to boost performance and speed up the pace of play in baseball? Look, we're talking about the first no-hitter in San Diego Padres history. So anybody who can do that, I mean, you tip their hat and you say, yes, more hydration. And for a sport that desperately needs to slow down. I mean, I interviewed Dave Parker over the weekend, the great Cobra from the 1970s Pirates, and he said he can't even watch the game now because it's too damn long. So yes, <laughs> pump them up full of water, get them, in, get them run into the urinals between innings, anything to get us a two and a half hour baseball game. <laughs> Perfect, Megan McPeak. I'm in, let's do it. I'm with, I'm with Dave on this one, speed it up. Speed it up, however we gotta do it, just speed the game up. But also reading that, my, I mean, I had to go pee when I read that he drank 12 bottles of water and I didn't drink anything. So I don't understand how uh, how he can do that and not, like, could he not go to the bathroom while he was not pitching and just sitting in the dugout? That's what like, I couldn't. What are you doing? That's what but I, I mean, couldn't figure superstition, out. Superstition, superstition. When you, when you're in yes. five and you haven't, you haven't had a hit. It's like, at that point you're like, all right, I'm going to ride this out until, <laughs> until. I yes. Get Plus Fernando Tatis Jr. is not playing, which means your team is not getting quite as many hits, which means the Padres half of the innings are a little bit shorter, which means you don't have quite enough time to go to the bathroom, especially if you're trying to avoid 11 or 12 bottles worth of water like that's a long trip that's not a short trip you got to do that during the seventh inning stretch uh, i'm all the way in on athletes staying properly hydrated the problem is 12 bottles is not properly hydrated like you drink that much water that quickly you could get sick so josh so uh, john musgrove is the exception and not the rule but if it makes him work faster because one thing you're not going to do when you got to pee is waste pitches you're going to pitch the contact you're going to get a bunch of ground balls you're going to get it out of there it's going to be like a roy halliday game you'll be done in two hours and 15 minutes all the reporters can hit their deadlines and we can get home to see our families um and so uh hydration aside um it has been really refreshing to hang out with Dave and Megan again. One more one one more Monday morning uh, meet up. I've come to cherish these. Uh, Megan, when you're not here, tell our audience where they can find you. On the Twitterverse at Megan McPeak. That's Megan with an H. <laughs> Perfect. That's the best way to spell it. Dave Zyron, tell the folks where they can find you. Uh, reach me at Edge of Sports. You can't find me on Spotify yet, but we're rocking New Electric Avenue, so that day is coming. <laughs> Perfect. In three years from now, if you need a keyboard player, maybe you can hit me up or yeah. hit up one of my mentors. Like I said, if I stay one lesson ahead of the kids, we're in business. Uh, as usual, I'm your host, Morgan Campbell. Um, you can find me on most platforms at Morgan P. Campbell, not most platforms, Twitter and Instagram, because I'm, I'm too old for TikTok, at Morgan P. Campbell. Like, subscribe, uh, check back with us every week. If you dislike, uh, dislike, uh, leave a comment. We don't care. All engagements matter. And we will see you guys next week uh, on Bring It In with Morgan Campbell.